There have been numerous UFO documentaries produced for television over the years, but in almost every instance, the opinions of skeptics and debunkers have tended to influence the final director's cut. The testimony of credible eyewitnesses to incredible events has tended to be devalued at best or totally ignored at worst. UFO's hard evidence aims to redress the balance by affording witnesses, as well as UFO researchers, the opportunity to state their case in front of our cameras. For want of a better description, UFO's hard evidence is the world's first UFO video magazine, bringing you the important interviews and images that really matter. The truth can indeed be found out there, provided that is, you know where to look. Coming up in Volume 1 of UFOs Hard Evidence. Huge and mysterious triangular shaped UFOs have been dominating the skies above Britain over the last few years. We talked to UFO researchers who have been at the forefront of investigating these strange occurrences. And we interview the pilot of a light aircraft whose routine flight over northwest England was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a strange triangular shadow. We have an exclusive interview with leading abduction expert Tony Dodd and quickly discover why he believes strange tales of people being whisked away in the night by alien visitors is very real and not imagined. In our global news roundup, we contrast the difference in public and media perception to the subject overseas with that experienced here in Britain. We also have some stunning images of the opening and closing ceremonies of the first World UFO Forum from Brazil the biggest UFO conference ever. As nossas palmas. We also take an in-depth look at some extraordinary NASA footage being back to Earth from orbiting space shuttles STS-80 and STS-48 and pose the vital question, is this conclusive evidence that Earth is being visited from beyond our planet? Or might it instead depict secret space technologies deployed by NASA? This and a few surprises elsewhere is contained in Volume 1 of UFO's Hard Evidence. Between 1989 and 1990, Belgium experienced a sudden and unexpected wave of UFO reports, all describing a huge and often silent triangular-shaped object. Over 2,000 eyewitnesses came forward to report their sighting, among them Belgian Air Force pilots and police officers. Skeptics would have you believe that every single one of the 2,000 reports can be rationally explained. They put forward misidentifications of conventional aircraft lights, the planet Venus, or other celestial bodies in space, stealth aircraft, or plain and simple hoaxes. These explanations may appear perfectly reasonable on the surface, but I would ask you to consider the sheer volume of reports, and also this. This hitherto classified document surfaced through the American Freedom of Information Act. It gives details about a Belgian television chat show in March of 1990. The subject debated was entitled, Belgium and the UFO Issue. Take a look at the distribution list contained within this document. Every major military and intelligence agency is featured. Even people at the White House received information about what was discussed, and by whom, on this program. If nothing else, this one single document blows away the myth that UFOs are not considered to be of defense significance. There have been over 400 radar observations made of UFOs down the years, but perhaps one of the most significant is a radar sequence released into the public domain by the Belgian Air Force itself. What you are seeing is the actual Belgium radar recording of a UFO which descends from 10,000 feet to 500 feet in less than five seconds. Had a human pilot been on board the UFO, the G-forces alone would have resulted in instant death. Skeptics and debunkers dismissed the radar footage by claiming the object was merely a reflection of some distant landmark. 
a temperature inversion created by freak weather conditions. Most conveniently forget to mention that two Belgian F-16 fighters had been ordered to intercept and identify the UFO in question. Did the pilots that night believe they had been simply chasing artificially created images? Listen now to the actual words of one of those pilots as he described what happened during this incredible encounter. It stays very calm and it does, you always get the feeling it has everything under control. Till, uh, till it says, well, now it's enough, and uh, always happened. I think with, with me it was uh, about 18 miles out that uh, the thing just decides, okay, this is enough. Get an increase of airspeed from uh, 50 to 100 miles an hour uh, straight to, uh, well, let's say uh, Mach 8, Mach 9, Mach 10, incredibly. And the altitude, well, uh, it went from uh, 5,000 feet straight up to uh, 60, 70,000 foot uh, just in a split second. Despite the fact ufologists have amassed over 400 actual radar recordings of UFOs down the years, and remember, those are only the ones we get to hear about, skeptics and debunkers continue to either totally ignore these, or worse, insist that in every case they had to have been produced by either faulty equipment or temperature inversions. Try telling that to the F-16 pilot. In March 1993, a huge triangular-shaped UFO penetrated British airspace and prompted Nick Pope, then head of the MOD's UFO desk, to conclude that it was extraterrestrial. Here's what he had to say about this particular incident. One particular wave of flying triangle sightings I investigated from around uh, the Lincolnshire area uh, I had received reports from UFO researchers that, uh, quote, cars were bumper to bumper on the coastal road and, and everyone had seen this object. And I thought, well, you know, maybe, but maybe not. Let's check it out. Let's just see if there isn't a bit of <coughs> exaggeration creeping in there. So, as it happened, there was a nearby military base, and so I phoned up the base commander and I said, look, I uh, hope you don't think this is bizarre, but we've heard these accounts. Uh, you know, but uh, perhaps you can put me straight. And the base commander said, well, actually, no, I can't. I was one of the people on that coast road, and my car was stopped, and I was looking out at this thing, along with the rest of them. And when I had things like that, I began to say to myself and to my bosses, you know, I don't think this business of no defense significance really holds up anymore. I don't think we can say that these things are all aircraft lights and weather balloons we've got something much more going on in our airspace. A flight of uh, a squadron, or rather four, tornado fighters were coming back across the North Sea to their base in Britain. The tornado is uh, pretty much one of the top aircraft in the RAF's inventory. These four aircraft were flying along quite happily. All of a sudden, they were overtaken at high speed by a UFO. Some sort of intergalactic joyrider or something came flashing past their cockpit and disappearing off into the distance. They couldn't catch it. They made a report, but really, all they dared put down was stealth, simply because they didn't know what else to say. I got into work on the 31st of March, 1993, and the phones were ringing off the hook. Throughout the course of the morning, it turned out that I was dealing with a huge wave of sightings over Britain. But there were some very, very interesting ones there. Um, a family in Rugeley in Staffordshire saw this thing so close up that they uh, leapt into their car and tried to chase it. It was moving slowly over the countryside. They'd heard this old familiar low humming sound, this low frequency sound that's rather akin to standing in front of the bass speaker at a pop concert, that sort of thing. Very unpleasant. Uh, they said they couldn't just uh, hear it, they felt it, the, the waves passing through their body. The best sightings, though, on that particular night, came from military personnel. The guard patrol at a place called RAF Cosford, near Wolverhampton, saw this move directly over the base. They were absolutely gobsmacked, and uh, they checked, of course, the radar. Interestingly, there was nothing on the radar at all. There was nothing booked to fly. This was very late at night, about 10 past 1 in the morning. They 
phoned the nearby RAF base, RAF Shawbury. And they said, you won't believe this, but we've just seen a flying saucer pass over the top of the base. Well, I think the uh, meteorological officer who took the call wondered perhaps whether they'd been having a little late night celebration or something. But uh, nonetheless, he went outside to see what he could see. And to his absolute amazement, he saw a light coming his way from the direction of Cosford. It got closer and closer and it resolved itself into uh, a very definite shape. He was not looking at a, a light in the sky, he was looking at a craft. He heard the low hum and he then witnessed the craft pass pretty much slap bang over the top of RAF Shawbury. He estimated that its size was midway between, it was very precise, you know, good military sighting, midway between a, a C-130 Hercules transport aircraft and a Boeing 747 jumbo jet. You know, you're talking about something pretty big, in other words. The most fascinating and uh, possibly disturbing aspect of this particular sighting was the fact that he had seen the craft fire what he could only describe as a beam of light down at the countryside a few hundred yards from the base. <laughs> you know, again, that was something that, uh, again, made me think, well, there's more to this than meets the eye. There just seemed to be too many reports that you couldn't explain. I mean, uh, you know, how, how many people think it's of no defense significance when, uh, you know, casually, a UFO overtakes the fastest of our jet fighters. I don't think that's of no defense significance. It worries the hell out. On the 1st of June, 1997, light aircraft pilot Malcolm Smith and a friend took off from Barden Airfield near Manchester en route to Carnarvon in North Wales. Weather conditions were ideal at the time. Shortly after 11.15 a.m., and while cruising at an altitude of approximately 1,500 feet, they both observed something beneath them which caused real alarm, the distinct outline of a massive triangle. UFO investigator David Caton was particularly intrigued, not least because he'd already interviewed a family who had spotted a flying triangle later that same day while travelling along the M56 motorway in Cheshire. Well, we're standing on the uh, control tower at Barton Aerodrome near Manchester and I'm talking to Malcolm Smith who's a pilot of uh, a Jodel aircraft and uh, I ended up speaking to Malcolm and his co-pilot because the uh, a family were coming along the M motorway, the M56, towards Stockport from holiday uh, on the evening of uh, Sunday 1st of June uh, 1997 and uh, saw this massive triangle and our local paper, the Stockport Express, put a little item out with the Seal family's agreement looking for other witnesses. And to our delight, uh, Malcolm rang me up because his uh, sister lives in the Stockport area, bought the paper, and remembered Malcolm telling her about this triangle they saw that undertook their aircraft on the same day, beautiful sunny morning, not like today, of the 1st of June. Um, so. Perhaps Malcolm would like to explain what himself and Martin saw when they were yeah. flying to Wales. Was it to, to oh, basically, uh, to Carnarvon. You found a route to, to go from Barton to Carnarvon, which entails us going along the edge of the uh, north uh, north edge of the Liverpool zone, which takes us a track along just south of Wigan and past a place called Rainford, which is uh, near St Helens. Yeah. We were cruising at about uh, 1,500 feet, uh, 90 knots approximately, when uh, <coughs> Martin, who was in the uh, co-pilot seat on the right-hand side, suddenly drew my attention to uh, a very large triangular-shaped shadow that was uh, overtaking our starboard wing, which uh, I saw immediately, and it just appeared to be a very sharply defined triangular-shaped shadow measuring approximately uh, 150 to 200 foot across the wingspan. It was travelling almost exactly the same direction as us, which is uh, due west. <coughs> and overtaking us, I would say it was probably doing twice the speed that we were doing. Uh, immediately we were a little bit concerned because the 
the nature of the shadow was so sharp and well defined you would ex expect it to be very close to where our aircraft was so I was quite concerned about the possibility of a, yeah. a collision. Yeah. So we had a look around everywhere to see uh, what it was that was creating the shadow there was absolutely nothing in the sky at all and it was clear blue sky it was much much clearer day than it is today. So um, we were really uh, taken aback by it and yeah. Uh, yeah. We were just uh, at a loss as to what it was that was causing it, so uh, we didn't really know what to do. So we just carried on, basically, to Carnarvon and <coughs> reported it to the uh, people there at the airport. Yeah. You, you logged it in your flying log, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. And your personal log, and I believe uh, a log here at the Barton as well. Yeah, right? there's two logs. There's a personal yeah. flying log, and then there's also a log which is attached to the aeroplane. Yeah. Anybody reports anything slightly unusual about the aeroplane or conditions of the day is put down on that yeah. log. Did you talk to any air traffic controllers like Manchester Airport? Uh, no, we didn't because uh, we were clear of the both the Liverpool and the Manchester zone. Uh, we were a long way to go to Carnarvon, so we didn't really uh, need to be in contact with anybody. We yeah. were still on Barton's frequency, but I thought yeah. it was inappropriate <coughs> to notify them about yeah. it at the time. All right, so we don't know whether they uh, they had it on radar, or even you were on radar to, to Manchester. They tend to follow people uh, that are fairly close to the zone on radar, yeah. just to make sure that they're not going to right. infringe into the so airspace. So you, you would have been on the radar, It's possible that we would have been on so radar, yes. we don't know, we won't know whether this thing causing the shadow was on their radar. No, no idea. Even though we couldn't see anything visually. Nothing at all, absolutely. Yeah. And we did a few clearing turns to, to make sure it wasn't behind us or yeah. above or below. Right. It was absolutely nothing. Yeah. Well, since that uh, event, we've had two other pilots contact us um, flying in a microlight mm. on uh, Sunday the 6th of July, so that's another, another Sunday uh, event, and they were flying back from um, uh, Cranfield in Bedfordshire from an aviation weekend, and they weren't too far from you, they were sort of Newton and Willows, uh, Haydock area they thought yeah. and uh, 1200 feet beautiful sunny day again they said and the, the, the triangle shadow passed them in the opposite direction uh, <coughs> they were undecided about speed between perhaps 60 miles an hour to 200 the two of them couldn't make That's their minds right. up the two brothers so uh, they were equally uh, nonplussed <laughs> uh, and mystified by it all because again they couldn't see a, 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 an object causing the uh, Mm. The shadow. Yeah. So that, that's interesting. We we may get some more information. I don't know. At approximately 11:45 p.m. that same night, Peter and Wynne Seal, with their two sons Craig and Scott, were travelling along the M56 motorway in Cheshire when they too spotted a triangular-shaped craft between junctions 11 and 12. Here's David Caden again. Well, on. The the night of Sunday the 1st of June, the Seal family, that's mum and dad, the sons Scott and uh, Craig, who are 17 and 20 years of age, were coming back from uh, Wales from holiday, back to Heaton Mersey in Stockport, and as they got to the uh, Junction 9 there, just behind us, uh, over the M6, this, they saw this triangular object hovering over the farm behind me, with lights on each corner, blue and red, uh, with white lights amongst them. Uh, way back they thought it was some lights on a, a tower because they were so still. They got to just past the junction here by the embankment and uh, the, the uh, triangle shot over the car at about 150 foot up and they experienced a sort of buzzing, humming noise as it went over. Uh, and then it went on to the opposite side of the motorway and followed down towards Stockport in their direction roughly about 200 yards into the field and uh, gradually pulling away from them and after about a mile, a mile and a half they seemed to be catching it up again and it seemed to be looking as though it was going to land anyway it slowed down, did a shallow sort of dive and disappeared behind the trees and bushes uh, though they couldn't actually see it touch the ground because of the, of the bushes Anyway, they weren't inclined to stop on the motorway. They were very shaken up to see if the object came back up again. So they carried on home to Stockport. There is no doubt in my mind that some of the so-called flying triangles, especially the smaller sized versions, 
might well be some form of covert experimental aircraft. Take, for example, the following case. We're here at Littendale in North Yorkshire. This entire region over the years has been synonymous with a great deal of UFO activity. At the river nearby, for instance, a farmer came across a glowing ball of light just a few feet above the surface water. The water underneath was bubbling. Just further across and beyond the river are some unusual stones. It's private land, but the whole area has been a regular scene of activity by SAS soldiers, presumably out on manoeuvres. But on Wednesday, the 14th of January, 1998, two witnesses had just arrived home here when they looked at the valley behind me. They saw a red light. What happened next seems to indicate an appearance by the mysterious flying triangle. Initially, I thought perhaps a tornado. Uh, in fact, I was very, very convinced it was a tornado. It was soundless, uh, but that, again, didn't surprise me. Uh, Vivian then looked up. Uh, uh, the aircraft was directly overhead at this time. Uh, what did surprise me was uh, the fact that it had uh, green lights down one side, uh, red lights uh, along the other wing. I then looked directly upwards as, as the aircraft was uh, overhead. Uh, there was two green lights on one of the wings on, on, on the side, uh, another two red lights on the opposite wing, a small white light somewhere I would think between the red uh, and the green lights and a very very large white light at the rear. At that point we could just make out a delta shaped aircraft. It certainly wasn't a tornado, it was still soundless and as it moves slightly past our position we've got the big uh, Hawkswick Moor Fell at the rear, there was a tremendous noise uh, as it gained altitude and it had to very very quickly otherwise it would probably have been straight into the fell. Didn't look like any aircraft that we see regularly flying over these tops. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced it was a, an aircraft. It looked quite similar uh, in configuration to uh, the Mirage, i.e. the Delta shape, but we couldn't see a front and we couldn't see a rear. Uh, we couldn't see any assembly underneath. Uh, but definitely the wings were very, very sharp, uh, which did surprise me. The noise was unusual, but that could have been because it was gaining altitude. What were the features about this particular observation that distinguished it from, say, normal military overflights? Yeah, this, this particular valley, uh, as I say, is renowned for uh, air exercises. Uh, usually when you see one aircraft like this, it's usually followed very, very quickly by one or two chase aircraft. Being conversant with uh, normal aircraft, you know, I, it was unusual in the sense that when it went overhead, there was a tremendous noise, a noise that I haven't heard before, uh, and it moved at an angle then possibly 70 degrees to take it over the fell, uh, which did surprise me. The noise was tremendous, but as I say, for six, seven seconds, it was absolutely silent. Uh, I couldn't explain uh, or, or identify the aircraft. Uh, what was unusual again was that approximately 60 minutes later uh, we heard the noise again and we immediately went outside and we could see the aircraft moving directly west. Now of course 20 miles west of here there have been numerous uh, observations of this so-called mysterious uh, flying triangle. Uh, I would say this was definitely a man-made vehicle, I've, I, you know, I've no doubt about that, but uh, I couldn't identify it, and it was definitely delta shape. and uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, the last real uh, delta shape aircraft the RAF flew was the Vulcan bomber, it certainly wasn't that. This was small, manoeuvrable, maybe 35 feet in length, uh, carried a, a light configuration which I hadn't seen before, uh, and as I say, uh, we see aircraft moving over here at all times of the day and night. Chance sightings of the flying triangles, often by credible and professional observers, has attracted the attention of numerous UFO researchers, keen to discover any clues as to their origin. Is there, for instance, anything to suggest that some of the flying triangles are indeed extraterrestrial? We put that question to leading British UFO investigator and former police officer, Tony Dodd. 
the thing which distinguishes what I consider to be extraterrestrial vehicles are the enormous triangles, the ones which are as big as football pitches, um, which once again carry the characteristic uh, either white light on each appendage and, uh, or red whatever, and they usually have this red belly light. These things have been reported coming out of the sea. Um, they've been reported hovering over fishing boats up in the Arctic Circle in the uh, Atlantic. Um, they've been reported hovering over motorways. Certainly I've had reports from over the M5 motorway, the M1, the M6, and we've had occasions uh, where these have been reported in Scotland, of course. And then there was the famous case in Scotland where one of these gigantic triangles uh, was seen to come down and land in a field and the witnesses actually observed alien creatures coming from them. How, how did these aliens manifest themselves? Well, they didn't manifest it, 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 it as such. What happened was they actually saw this um, craft on the ground, and they were no more than 50 yards away from it, and they had a pair of binoculars with them. And uh, it appears that the aliens weren't aware they were being observed. They, they, they were what, uh, uh, there were a large number of the small aliens, the small which we would normally call the grey aliens. What sort of numbers are we talking about? Well, the witnesses said that at one stage they thought there could have been up to a hundred. And they seemed to be working in, in groups, uh, each under the supervision of a, of a tall, um, a tall brown-faced oriental looking alien. They said the, the tall ones could have been anything up to seven feet tall. And it was obvious when they'd been watching it for a few minutes that, that each one group of these small aliens was working under the supervision of one of these very large ones. And they were racing about uh, in, in and out of the, the forest, which was next to where the craft was down, carrying tubular and round objects. Um, and they, they, weren't, they were going from the craft to the forest and back. And the witnesses weren't sure whether they were taking stuff from the craft to the forest or vice versa. Uh, but they were very graphic with the descriptions and um, other things that they sort of should describe at the time, i.e. Uh, hovering balls, like uh, glass balls which were dimpled like a golf ball, um, and inside one of these balls was one of these um, very large oriental aliens. Uh, this ball was hovering off the ground 15, 20 feet, and it was slowly but surely rotating. Um, possibly an observer, we don't know. Possibly somebody who was a lookout, if, that's, if they use that kind of thing, I don't know, but that is what was described as happening. If you're still uncertain as to the origins of the flying triangles, here's something that I'd ask you to consider. If these flying triangles are indeed some form of unconventional stealth-type craft, that would mean there would have to be dozens of covert squadrons operating them, simply to account for the many thousands of worldwide sightings. It's an interesting proposition, and one that the skeptics and debunkers have difficulty accepting. But let's not kid ourselves. The United States Air Force can, of course, keep secrets. This photograph, for instance, of an F-117 stealth aircraft was taken in 1975, a full 15 years before the aircraft was finally unveiled to the public. But has modern technology reached the stage where it can manufacture triangular craft as big as football fields that can hover silently, craft that can move from horizon to horizon in the blink of an eye, craft that can safely enter and emerge from our oceans? Those are the important questions we must ask. We might not at this present time have all the answers, but we will continue to probe in the right places in an effort to get to the bottom of this mystery once and for all. And when we do, when we do have some real answers, you'll find them here in UFOs, Hard Evidence. Coming up next on UFOs Hard Evidence, are abductions real? What evidence links them to animal mutilations? An exclusive interview with Tony Dodd. In this exclusive interview with leading UK investigator Tony Dodd, we examine two specific areas of UFO research which often lends itself to scorn and criticism. Alien abductions and animal mutilations. We invited Tony to tell us what first sparked his interest in the phenomenon. It was 20 years ago, it's a long time, 1978 when I was a police officer. Um, I actually had a confrontation with one of these things when I was a, 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 a working police officer. And um, I was on duty one night in 78 when me and a colleague actually had a confrontation with one of these things. Where was this? 
This was Connolly near Skipton in North Yorkshire. And uh, we, we, I was driving a police car, he was the observer. And we came round a bend in the country lane and there was this thing sitting in the air in front of us. And uh, it was absolutely stunning to see. It was a huge disc, about 100 feet in diameter. Had a dome on the top of it um, with what appeared to be portals, darkened portals around the dome. Um, it had a skirt in a, um, around the underside and uh, coloured flashing lights which were flashing on and off, almost like a neon uh, sign effect. And there was three large um, globes or, or balls protruding uh, from the underside. They were spaced evenly on the underside. I stopped the car and we got out. Uh, there was a very, very heavy, heavy static had come on the police car radio at that time. Um, I don't know the cause of it. It may have been because of this thing was there, but um, it wouldn't be right to jump to conclusion. But this static suddenly set up on the radio, and uh, uh, I got out of the car, both of us did, and we stood there, sort of open mouth, looking at this thing as it slowly moved away from us. But despite it, uh, despite its enormous size, there was there was no um, sound coming from the damn thing. Uh, the only sound that we heard at that time was where it was displaced in the air when it started to move away from us, and. Um, the thing was, though, it was, it, was absolutely, it was absolutely beautiful to look at it. I, I couldn't, remember, I couldn't help remembering at the time, uh, thinking, what kind of engineers put something like this together? Because it was absolutely extraordinary, it was. And that's what got me into the thing, because I was determined I was going to find out. I mean, I'd uh, not long been out of the RAF, and um, my last postings, I'd been on Air, Air Force bases where they were testing the very latest um, technology in aircraft. And at that time, the aircraft of the time, which we were, we were under test, were the uh, Lightning, because um, we had a, it was a Lightning station when I was on, and the Canberra, and that was our most advanced technology at the time. They were only testing them at that time; they're test flying them. Now, this thing was years and years and years ahead of anything like that. It was no question about it at all. It uh, it was something that we hadn't got, and I knew it from the moment I saw it. Tony, you've now become a fully fledged and widely respected UFO investigator in your own right, but would it be fair to say that your initial broad interest in the UFO subject has focused on two specific areas? I'm thinking particularly about your recent work in abductions and animal mutilations. What is it about these two areas that attracts your interest? Well, let's be, uh, in the first instance, when I got involved in this business, I had no idea it was going to take me in the, the direction it did. Um, I've been, mainly been governed by uh, instances which have come to my notice. And uh, the abduction side of it was when somebody came to me, once again as a policeman, and said that they'd been um, chased by a helicopter um, some years ago. And uh, the end product was that they'd ended up with missing time and they were complaining about the low flying of this helicopter. Well, of course, I checked on this as a policeman and found that there was no helicopters, of course, flying at this particular time, and they certainly wouldn't be flying in that location at night because of low uh, uh, high voltage of wire low over the roads. Um, that took me into the uh, abduction side of things. And as things developed, you tend to go, it's like the, the branches of a tree. You go up the main trunk with the, your normal UFO work, and you're suddenly led in different directions. All sorts of things are associated with this, as you well know. The animal mutilation started to come into the, the picture when they were starting to get high concentrations of UFOs in specific areas. And then within very, very short time, people were finding animals killed and mutilated in very strange ways. Um, and that is when I started to focus on this as possibly linked to the UFO phenomenon. Uh, as with the abduction case, uh, the first case I ever dealt with, when this was looked in at great length, it turned out, um, of course, eventually hypnosis was used to try to recover the missing time of this individual. Um, and we got the classic um, answers from this person, there's no doubt about it being an abduction involved. And it, and it all went from that particular direction. Now, skeptics and debunkers, of course, will continue to maintain that all such accounts of so called alien abductions are foolish nonsense. How would you counter these? Well, first of all, it was the skeptics and debunkers that said that the world was flat for 300 years, uh, despite um, some of the top scientists of the time saying it was round. It's very, very easy for a skeptic or debunker to turn around and say uh, to people who've done years and years of research, this is absolute rubbish. It's very, very easy. This is what they do all the time. And of course, when we say, well, you, you prove to me uh, that what I'm saying is rubbish, and they will turn around and say, well, it's not for us to prove that you're right. Uh, it's, it, it's not for us to prove that you're wrong, it's for you to prove that you're right. 
and uh, so we're always going to be faced with this thing and as much information as you put before these people they will do their best to pull it to pieces um, but the facts are the facts uh, particularly uh, if we talk about things like um, alien abductions uh, where there's such a, variety, a, a wide variety of people being involved in this and I'm talking about highly intelligent people and a great many who know nothing whatsoever about the subject we're getting them all over the world as you well know people who are very very backward are not uh, in touch with the media and things like that and they're telling the same stories now is everybody imagining things uh, is everybody making these things up what are they to gain uh, uh, particularly these sort of backward countries by saying things like this but that is not the point it's the facts that point to abduction and there are so many many facts which are occurring repeatedly uh, which I'm absolutely convinced they're taking place Can you describe the tool? What does it look like? One's got a probe now. And I know, I, I understand this time what they're saying. And that there seems to be great excitement in, in the fact that I've had hysterectomy. Goodness only knows why. And that they're all coming together now and, and oh, they're, they're so, so interested in, in, in what has happened there and the whys and the wherefores. And, and these three seem to have spoken to this one and, and, and it's up to this one to get the probe. And I see this probe. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, they're not going to hurt you. The next thing is that this probe goes in my navel, <laughs> and it hurts so much. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm screaming, I'm begging for God's sake, you're causing me so much pain. Uh-huh, yes, yes. And, and at this point I, I beg them that they don't stop, they just carry on. It's just as if they've got a job to do, and it's as if they don't hear what they don't want to hear, but they carry on. What, what sort of background do these people have? Once again, a wide, a wide background. It come, they come from all sorts of uh, different backgrounds. Um, you, as I say, you can go from the office worker, the shop worker, uh, to somebody who's a company director, to somebody who works for, uh, in a high level position for the Ministry of Defence, uh, people who are actually in the military. You name it, they're all involved. Now, lately you've been investigating and reporting on numerous accounts of strange, some might say bizarre, animal mutilation deaths. When did you first come across these, and where precisely? Well, the, they're certainly bizarre, that's for sure. Um, oh, many years ago, um, I'd been monitoring uh, certain... It was basically, again, UFOs. We, we were getting concentrations of UFO reports. That's We were focusing on the UFOs. And then... Um, it uh, seemed to transpire that when these UFOs had been in the area, people started to find these mutilated animals. So I started to look uh, much deeper into this. And then it, it, it went from one thing to another. It started off mainly up in the, uh, the highlands of Scotland, where they started to find large numbers of seals uh, dead on the beaches, uh, minus their heads. Their heads had been surgically removed. And uh, I spoke to the police up there, I spoke to the veterinaries who did the autopsies on these bodies, and they were all, everybody was baffled. Um, in what, on one occasion they found uh, 40 seals dead on the, uh, a beach, a dry beach. And um, the vet said every one of the seals had had their, said, their head removed um, in a very uh, precise surgical manner. In fact, every head had been cut off and the, the actual knife or whatever instrument was used cut between the same vertebra on every animal. And the thing that was very predominant in all these cases was that there was a total blood loss from the bodies. Um, when I say blood loss, the, the blood had apparently disappeared from the carcasses. 
There was never any sign of blood on the ground, like with the seals, there was no sign of any blood on the beaches. Um, there was no sign of any blood on the ground uh, where the animals had been killed. Uh, there were a hole, they had a hole in their head um, and it appeared that the, uh, the blood had been drained out of the bodies through this hole until the carcasses were totally dry of blood. But also the brain and spinal cord was missing from some of these animals through a, a very, very small hole. And um, just that fact alone w made the vets say, well, how the hell is, how can something, something do something like this? Now, the interesting thing is that the, the, one, the one common factor with these things is the fact that there was always uh, some form of strange aerial activity being t seen taking place in the areas where these things were happening. Obviously, this is what drew me towards it. Now, uh, th there was all sorts of things. There was one where 40 pigs were killed in one field overnight. Um, but what I started to look at, it, 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 we don't just look straight at these things, trying to sort of work out what is, what is uh, behind it. And what we were finding, there were large numbers of animals being found in very concentrated areas, i.e. In, in a space of 50 feet on one incident. Uh, there were several sheep dead, there were foxes dead, there was a dead, uh, two dead deer and a dead donkey, all in very, very close proximity to each other. Now, if you look at this closer, you find that these animals would normally not be seen, seen anywhere in the vicinity of each other. They all have their own type of territory, uh, but yet they were all in this very close, uh, close uh, area, um, all dead. That then implied that whatever it was that was killing these animals was actually taken from their normal habitat, doing what they do to them, and then placing them all back on the ground in one lump. In other words, they were taking a cross-section of animals, doing these things to them, and then dumping them all in the same place. The very, I think the breakthrough from my point of view came um, not very long ago, certainly less than 12 months ago, when a, um, a chap was driving a vehicle over a, a very remote moor over near uh, Whitby. Uh, in the dead of night, he was on his way back home, he had um, one of these breakdown trucks. Uh, no, it wasn't, it was a, he had been delivering scrap metal and he was on his way back with his, his vehicle. And suddenly as he was driving across the moor top, he's confronted with these blinding lights coming towards him on the road. Um, he got so frightened because of this, he thought this vehicle was going to crash into him, he actually pulled off the side of the road to allow it to get past. Um, this thing shot past him, uh, and then when it had gone past, of course, he pulls back onto the road and starts to drive. But he'd only gone 50 or 60 feet further down the road, and he had to stop again because there were all the dead animals lying in the road. On this occasion, there was a dead donkey, there were dead deer, dead sheep, dead foxes, all lying in the middle of the road, and he couldn't get past. He actually had to tie an anchor, um, a rope from his vehicle onto uh, the donkey and, and some of the deer and tow them up to the side of the road enable, to enable him to get past. Now, work it out for yourself. If um, something like that's happened, how has that vehicle come in the other way, passed along that road? And uh, I am totally convinced now that this thing wasn't on the road surface, probably just above the road surface after uh, initially dumping these things and then uh, shooting away. Following on from that, that some form of predator might be at work here and responsible for these horrendous mutilations. Uh, what are we to make of this? I honestly and truly believe, and I'm, I've gone into this animal mutilation in great depth, believe me, um, I honestly believe that there is a predator out there. But I believe... More than one? Oh, difficult to say. But, I mean, if it's covering the, the, the uh, as on a global basis as it is, I would certainly suggest there's more than one because it's happening all over the world. Um, but the thing is, when I say predator, it's, I don't think it's a predator by any concept we understand. I think this is something, we, when we tend to talk alien, I think this is alien to anything we really understand. It might be something which travels in the in invisibility zone. Let's be right, there are things that we can't see, i.e. we can't see infrared, but it's there. Th these things may travel in these zones. They may be invisible to the naked eye. Uh, they may come and do what they do. Uh, and we aren't going to see them if they're there anyway. We just don't know. The $64,000 question is why are they doing it? Um, and I know there have been various reports from various parts of the world that, that it's poss just possible that, that it's could have involved odd humans here and there, but I'm not going to go into that. Finally, there are people probably watching this interview and wondering, is this man for real? Are UFOs real? If you could look at that person right now, what would you say? I would say, first of all, seek and you will find. But don't just condemn this subject without investigating it. It's very, very easy to turn around and condemn things just off the top of your head. 
We've put a lot of time and a lot of years into this investigation. And I can assure you, without any question of a doubt, that aliens are here, aliens have been here for a long time, and aliens are in contact with various elements of the military and other um, countries, uh, diplomats. Uh, it wouldn't be prudent to me to say any more at this time, but if you, you can believe me if you wish. If you don't believe me, well, that's entirely up to you. But I gain nothing by saying these things. Only these are the things that uh, I have uncovered during my investigations. Over the past few years, our research has taken us to many foreign lands in search of hard evidence for the reality of UFOs. We visited the outer perimeters of the top secret facility known as Area 51 in Nevada, claimed by some to house crashed and recovered UFOs. It was interesting that during a time spent in nearby Las Vegas, we managed to film this mysterious object, which hovered in the distance right over Area 51 before shooting away at speed. Just a couple of years ago, while in the airport terminal of Rio de Janeiro, en route to attend a conference in Curitiba, Brazil, a pencil-thin object appeared overhead. It lingered long enough for us to capture these astonishing images. The very next day, while outside the conference venue in Curitiba itself, this unusual object appeared overhead. Was it pure coincidence that such objects should suddenly manifest themselves in front of an invited audience? In December last year, I had the good fortune to attend the first World UFO Forum in the Brazilian capital, Brasilia. The following sequence is taken from the opening ceremony and perhaps reflects the stature attached to what was by far the biggest and perhaps the most important UFO conference ever staged in the history of the subject. As you've no doubt already gathered, the importance that some attach to the UFO subject overseas is in stark contrast to the ridicule which is often heaped upon it here in Britain and the United States. Nonetheless, UFO researchers continue to plug away. These researchers are looking for something tangible which can be used as material evidence in the great debate. One of these is photo and video analyst Russell Callahan, who combines his professional work with sifting through alleged UFO images that can often surface from the most surprising of places. On the 15th of September 1991, the Space Shuttle Discovery videotaped several glowing objects that floated along just above the Earth's horizon, before sharply changing direction, apparently in response to a flash on the upper surface of the atmosphere. Watch now as two streaks, some say missiles, pass through the same region of space vacated by the object. While NASA maintains the smaller objects were nothing more than ice crystals, a claim dismissed by Dr. Jack Kasher, PhD, another segment of footage picked out by Russell Callahan might yet prove to be more significant. Jack Kasher, PhD, was intrigued. He wanted to back NASA's claims that ice crystals affected by the, the rockets and, and, and the boosters on the space shuttle were what we were seeing on this particular videotape. He was astonished to find that on five separate occasions not only could he prove that it wasn't ice crystals but what we're looking at are intelligently controlled craft leaving and entering the Earth's atmosphere. Those are Dr. Cash's own claims. But the concentration has been on the streaks across the sky and the flashes. The flashes could well be the booster rockets of the shuttle maneuvering it in space. But further on there's another piece of footage which is more interesting to myself that could actually show something that's not supposed to exist. What we're looking at here is an HL20. It's a prototype, it's an artist's drawing, it's an impression. It's never been built, so we're led to believe. The concept is for a ten-man shuttle or a small amount of payload, something that, be, that could be launched into space cheaply to feed our impression of space station freedom. It could be a support vessel. Well, take a look at these three images. Three frames from the STS-48 footage. A distant object filmed from what is basically a security type camera, a small black and white camera, not made for TV images, not made 
for production use just so that the astronauts on board the shuttle can actually see what's going on inside the payload bay. Well, the payload bay is empty at this point. For three frames, we've seen a triangular shaped object coming towards the shuttle. The camera actually follows it and the lighter area at the top is actually the atmosphere of the Earth as the, the, the arm with the camera on pans and tilts to follow this object. Now we can see clearly a delta shaped wing and a tail. Don't forget this is still probably several thousand feet away from the space shuttle. But if we read what the Langley Research Centre told us about the HL20 and their idea that a small shuttle 29 feet long capable of carrying up to 10 astronauts into low Earth orbit or small amounts of payload. All very interesting. But the thing that they claim back in the 1980s are that with its wings folded, it will fit inside the payload bay of the shuttle. Now, what more? An empty shuttle bay, a camera. Are we watching the HL-20 or a prototype of the HL-20 coming into the shuttle? Who knows? But these questions have never been answered by NASA or by anyone else. STS-80 is much more recent than STS-48. STS-80 was at the end of 1996. What you're about to see are remarkable images filmed from the space shuttle and filmed from a remote camera. Not a camera like the one we're using to record this programme, but a camera that's made just to see in the back door of the shuttle. It's not made for high resolution pictures, but watch what happens. The flashes, lightning strikes, these occur every minute of the day somewhere on the Earth. And of course we're seeing quite an area of the Earth. Plenty of lightning strikes, thunderstorms, basically just weather activity. But the interesting point comes with these small objects seem to be wandering about. Controlled objects that seem to know where they're going. But watch the centre area of the screen. Something quite remarkable is about to happen. Not only is something remarkable happening, we see an enormous object come through the clouds. If there were people on the shuttle or people monitoring these cameras at ground control, you would think that someone would say, Hey, what's going on up there? Well, watch. In the bottom right hand corner of the screen, three objects form in a triangular shape. You think if somebody was watching and they had the facility to zoom with the camera, then they'd get closer. Let's have a proper look. And indeed, that's just what they do. The footage you've just seen was sent to us by the San Francisco UFO Museum. Remarkable as it is, it's been offered to news companies, documentary makers, broadcasters alike. It's yet to be seen on British television. Why? Perhaps the best visual images of UFOs to surface in recent years has been those taken over Mexico.
These extraordinary images brought to this country by UFO researcher Santiago Garza amply demonstrate why Mexico has become the UFO hotspot of the world. Another leading figure helping to bring such images to a much wider world audience is television presenter and UFO researcher Hami Massan, among the guest overseas speakers at the 1998 Leeds International UFO Conference. Hami often comes across all manner of strange and bizarre images while researching the UFO phenomenon, but surely none more strange or bizarre than the sequence you are about to see now. This remarkable footage is claimed to have been taken in New Mexico in the early part of 1997. Watch closely as the UFO descends to the ground. Note the rising dust and debris from impact. Then see how the UFO takes back to the air, only to descend one final time before exploding on impact. Watch the sequence again. Note the clouds of dust, the vapor trail, and also note how the picture remains still indicating it was possibly mounted on a tripod and that the cameraman knew what to expect. The UFO crash video might be nothing more than images taken of an experimental aircraft or missile that badly malfunctioned, but then again, who's to say? It's yet another piece to add to a puzzle that continues to fascinate and attract the attention of millions throughout the world. Sure enough, the images that we've seen and the accounts that have accompanied them could be construed as hard evidence, but of what specifically? Are aliens visiting our planet? If so, who are they? Where are they from? And why are they here? These are deep-seated questions that will eventually be answered in the course of time. But time for now at any rate is against us. We hope very much that you've enjoyed this presentation and are a little better informed as a result. Keep watching the skies, and I hope you can join us again in Volume 2 of UFOs, Hard Evidence.